Bejigal people that lived here. And uh, yeah, it would have been very cold the last few days, but the sun's out now and it would have been a great place to live. And we've still got uh, the Bejigal people in the community um, around and contribute to UNSW. So I acknowledge their custodianship of the land uh, on which I'm sitting and I, I encourage all of you to think about where you are today and the, the past and the contributions of the Indigenous people to this country and its culture. Um, so Kate, we have Dr. Kate Wilson from UNSW uh, Canberra and Kate's a member of the Education Academy, of course. Um, she's at the School of Engineering IT. <coughs> Uh, she teaches engineering mechanics. She's a physicist, um, a PhD at Monash. Uh, also has a degree in teaching, and she um, for one of our most important programs, the beginning to teach foundations of uh, university learning and teaching. And I sort of feel I should brush up on that to learn more about Moodle. Now, Kate was. Um, the first year coordinator at ANU and the director of the Australian Science Olympiads Physics Program, where Australia has done success uh, spectacularly well for many years, and that's terrific. And we're glad to have her with us contributing to um, education at UNSW. She also does research on student learning in physics. Um, the first year transition, which is important. And yes, assessment and gender. I think that's, I remember you've spoken in the series before, perhaps it was that one. Um, she's published very widely uh, on these topics and also Kate does outreach to uh, schools, which is terrific. Today, we're sharing what is going to go down history in history as this uh, remarkable I think the word people use is pivot to online uh, teaching. And she's going to talk about things that worked and things that didn't work, things we can learn from. Uh, I'm just going to look, we've got 49 people here, which is terrific. I encourage you to make comments in the chat. And I hand over to Kate, who'll talk to until about 1.15, then we'll have 15 minutes of questions. So I'll mute myself now so we don't get feedback. I encourage everyone to mute and over to you, Kate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Melon. Um, before I launch in, I'm not going to do a complete um, acknowledgement, but just, uh, I guess, adding to Merlin, so just acknowledging the traditional landowners of where I am, which is in Canberra, which is the Ngunnawal people. Um, Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is how CIT, so the School of Engineering and IT, transitioned to online in response to COVID. Um, Merlin did say questions at the end, and I will try to finish in good time to have questions at the end as well, but please do feel free to bung your microphone on and yell out, use the little hand up, raise your hand thing. Um, to ask a question or post something in chat. I just, I know when I'm teaching, that is massively how I prefer students to do things so that we can deal with things as we go. Okay, now, oh good. Hang on, I should have done more of a practice. Slide two, hopefully you're all seeing slide two now. So, I'm not gonna give you an accurate timeline because when I started trying to do that, I found that everything just happened so incredibly quickly in the first few weeks of semester that actually establishing what happened when was a little bit challenging. But roughly this is how it worked for us. So at the start of semester one, things were pretty much as normal here. And the points in grey there are the as normal stuff. So the stuff that's kind of how it is here and things that haven't particularly changed. So our classes are very small compared to what people at the Kensington campus are used to. We have an annual intake into the whole of the campus of about 350 students each year. So our biggest classes are around about the 250 student kind of size. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Most of the classes are a lot less than that. So I teach one of the larger courses in CIT and I have 100 students in my course. 
and that's considered a large class here. Um, I did actually teach at the Kensington campus many, many years ago, and I think I had 600 odd in one of my classes there. So this is, this is, it's different here. We have smaller classes, it's a smaller campus, and all of, almost all of our students are Australian Defence Force trainee officers. So that's the ADF TOs there. And they live on campus, they work together, they train together, they study together. The TOs are a really, really tight group. Basically, if you say something to one TO, you've approximately said it to all of them. You can't rely on that as an information transfer, but you have to assume that <clears throat> things are just going to kind of get passed around through them. One of the really good things about that is that there is a strong culture of collaboration, which personally I think is excellent for learning. So I think it's something that we are able to assume here more so than I've been able to assume when teaching on civilian campuses. And we have a strong relationship with ADVA. And it's often referred to on campus as a mum and dad relationship. I'm not 100% sure which one's mum and which one's dad. I think possibly UNSW is the mum side and the ADVA side is the dad side. And part of that is the pastoral care that our students get. So partway at at least one point through semester, lists of students who we consider at risk academically or for any other reason, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, or for any other reason get passed back to defence. The divisional officers then talk to the students um, and they get support. Or in occasional cases, they get an attitude adjustment. So that's the kind of background. That's what that's our business as usual, normal kind of situation. And the other thing is that because our students are on campus and because they are required to attend, almost all of our teaching is face to face. So Moodle has been primarily used for well, things like discussion boards, for announcements, for providing lecture notes so students can get them in advance. <clears throat> but for that sort of thing, not for actually presenting classes. And the attendance is very, very close to 100% in any given class. So that's where we were beginning of March this year. And then, I'm pretty sure it was week three, we were told everything has to move online and it has to move online now. So we, I think it was a Thursday that the announcement came out. We had face-to-face -face classes still on Friday and that was it. That was the last of the face-to-face -face classes. So it was a very, very rapid change over to being completely online. There were 54 undergraduate courses in CIT in first semester and so all of them had to move. I know a lot of the people just from seeing the names pop up in the sidebar as people joined, I know there are a lot of engineering people here but for those who are not kind of from a STEM discipline, engineering is very hands-on and it also has a lot of contact hours. So this, I hope you can see my pointer, this picture on the left hand side, this is a couple of my students you know, pre-COVID. This is how Tutes ran. We had hands-on activities in Tutes, they built things, they experimented with things, they designed stuff. And then moving to online, that had to stop. So it was a really, really big transition. Um, engineering contact hours, my course has six contact hours a week, every week, plus labs. So the labs only happen a few times in semester and there's about another six, eight hours of lab on top of those contact hours. So May's just asked, do they still wear, have to wear uniform online? Um, no. So this is one of my students. So he is out of uniform. And it's actually kind of, it's a bit weird seeing them out of uniform. You know, you get so used to seeing them always in uniform and then you see them in civvies and you take a minute to actually recognise them. Um, but certainly in class, yeah, they always, face to face, they are in uniform. So we had within it already the teaching support team. Um, and I'm the course quality assurance coordinator in it, So I'm the, the lead in the teaching support team. So I look after that team. 
And we were asked to stop what we were doing and instead start supporting and monitoring the, tr the transition to online teaching. So the teaching support team. It was created in 2018, so it's a relatively new part of See It anyway. And it was created to do course reviews um, and to review all of our courses against the See It quality teaching framework, which is a framework that was developed within See It primarily by Diana Townsend, who is now the coordinator of learning and teaching development at UNSW Canberra. So she was within See It for a year, um, worked with see it academics to develop the qtf and then ts well she set up the initial the the, the initial um incarnation of tst which started running the course reviews against that framework so we did the pilots were happening in 2018 last year i took over as course quality assurance coordinator from diana and that was when we moved into our business as usual mode of doing course reviews and we had 17 academics at that point. And then in 2019, we also started doing um, some providing some teaching professional development within the school. So running workshops by people who were already within TST, as well as getting in external organisations. So, for example, we had Perform Australia come and give us a workshop on presence. Um, yeah, mainly about presence and performance in the classroom. At the start of 2020, we were gearing up to start doing postgraduate reviews. Um, I had a postgraduate advisory group set up from people teaching in the postgraduate courses, including a few sessionals. And at that point, we had 17 TST members. And then we got the instruction, stop doing course reviews, support and monitor the transition. So this is what we did. The first thing we did was bring more people in. So I emailed all the past members of TST, emails went out to the school saying, please, if you've got some spare capacity right now, please consider joining TST and supporting your colleagues in this transition. I formed three expert teams. Um, so this was largely relying on the postgraduate advisory group that had been formed to help us figure out how to do postgrad reviews, because I figured these guys have been teaching online. Most of the rest of us haven't been. So hopefully they will be able to help us with this transition. And it turned out that they were actually a fantastic resource for us. So we put together three expert teams, each with three people on them. Um, one team to, to advise us on online assessment, one on content and one on engagement. Because what we really wanted to avoid were the kind of boring static courses where you kind of go in and yeah they're self-paced you can work through them that's cool but there's no sense of being part of a community of learners so engagement was one of the three pillars and hence one of the three expert teams that we formed um and i just want to put in a plug here for elena so elena sitnikova ran the engagement team and that was so helpful having an expert in the postgraduate domain to help with that um, I'm not sure if Hua Dong is here, but Hua Dong ran the assessment team and the contact content team was led by Andre Allenen. So we had people who already had expertise putting together teams and acting as support for the rest of us. What we then did was we assigned a personal contact within TST to each course convener. So each of those 54 course conveners, well, 54 courses, not quite 54 conveners. At a guess, I'd say maybe 40, probably 40 odd. There were a lot of conveners. So each of them was assigned a personal contact within TST. And those contacts were also given access to the Moodle sites of, for the courses that they were assigned to. So what that gave us was, were links links between each individual back into TST, rather than simply doing a, hey, we're TST, contact us if you need us, we actually made sure that we were proactive in contacting people and letting them know this is your point of contact. We then put in place a triage process for solving problems. But before I talk about the triage process for the engineers and other people who like diagrams, this is this is the setup that we had. 
So in here within See It is the teaching support team. Kind of within TST, but sort of also sitting to the side of that were the three expert teams. So assessment, content and engagement. And I tried early on to kind of put it out as a slogan there, make your transition ace. Um, but yeah, no one else seemed to like that. So we have TST, we have our expert team sitting kind of partly within TST and engaged with the TST members. And all of this sits within the school itself. <laughs> Outside of See It, we've got the learning and teaching group. Um, I mentioned Diana Townsend earlier. So as the coordinator of learning and teaching development, she sits within, this is actually really should, I should have just put a picture of Diana here. So Diana was also a member of TST, which is why this arrow is gray rather than blue. And then within the learning and teaching group, we also have the technology enhanced learning something, something or other. So the technology enhanced learning people. Um, and this is very small. Remember, we're a small campus. This is four people, Intel's effectively. So what we couldn't do was overwhelm them with every single one of our 54 courses, contacting them and saying, ah, what do I do? Ah, how do I do this? How do I put up a test in Moodle? How do I do something else? How do I do whatever? So that's where our triage process was really important in making sure that the TELS people were able to solve the problems that we couldn't solve as well as developing things and doing the stuff that they do well. It's like Gal Gary's comment there, acronymy. Being at ad for honestly, everything got acronyms. Got to have acronyms. So we provided a link between the TELS people, so the experts, and the school as a whole. So we basically acted as a filter. And we did a similar thing for see at exec. So that enabled the head of school, the deputy head teaching, um, other people on the teaching leadership group to get on with the, with the decision making. So to come up with policy, to frame it and to put it out there for the school. And then we were able to, as, to a group, not completely, but we certainly tried to as much as possible, then handle all the queries that were coming in about, well, hang on, what do you mean I've got to give students 24 hours to do this. What if I do this? And we could answer a lot of those questions instead of having all of this stuff going up to exec where they really didn't have time to deal with it and nor should they be dealing with it. And then exec, of course, linked out to BERT, the business unit response team, um, associate dean education, the ADF and all those other groups outside of SEAD. And I can see a few people appreciate my diagram, which is good. Sorry, I can hear someone's mic on. Is that a question? Feel free to yell out. Nope, I'm going to click onwards then. OK, so this was our triage process. And the aim of this was to make sure that problems got solved quickly, because remember, we were trying to get this transition happening in days, not weeks, not months, days. So days from business as usual to students are not going to be in your classes. They're just not full stop. Um, and we, so we had to do it quickly, but we also didn't want to waste the time of people who had better things to do. So we were trying to solve things at the lowest level possible. So the messaging to staff was consistent and clear and repeated many, many times, which is if you've got a problem, start with your TST contact. If the TST contact couldn't help, then it either got passed on to me or it got passed on to the see it tells person. And ideally it kind of everything you know, the rest of TST stayed in the loop through information going up on our team site. Certainly, any, certainly the idea was that we didn't duplicate effort. So once a problem was solved for one person, 
that knowledge should then sit within TST so that when it came up again, which almost invariably happens, we were ready with the solution. So, for example, Owen, who is our TELS person, who is absolutely fantastic, only had to solve, ideally, should only have had to solve any given problem once. And then we had the solution and we could pass it on as needed within TST. Um, and May has asked, is there documentation of the problem? Yeah, we tried to keep documentation as we went. Um, it's it's not in as good condition as I would have liked, unfortunately. It was just so much of a rush that while we initially set up files to put in, this is the problem, this is the solution, um, that wasn't really kept up to date particularly well. So it tended to end up residing in people's heads. But it did at least mean that any time someone came up with a problem they hadn't seen a solution to before, they could post a message on Teams or contact me or one of the expert teams as appropriately. Um, the other thing that we did was we curated resources. <laughs> Very much education ER, yes, spot on. So as I guess a lot of you, depending on whether you're EF staff, but even if you're not, you will get various other newsletters. So one of the other things we did was we curated resources. So all the various newsletters that were coming in, anything that we came across, things that we thought, yeah, this is good, we can use this, or I know someone in the school who's trying to do this, that stuff would be shared via the school newsletter. And then there's also a head of school Moodle site, which is really handy. So there's a great big section on that now, which has resources for moving online. And one of the really handy resources within that are checklists. So each of the expert teams came up with a checklist. And there have been two versions of at least two versions of each of those checklists. The first version was the emergency semester one version. So, you know, this is kind of the minimum. This is what you've just got to do and you've got to get it done now kind of checklists. And it include, included basic stuff like, um, you know, make sure that you post a message to all your students telling them what's going on and make sure you post regular updates on what's happening. Things like that, just really basic, got to do stuff. Resources were also shared on an individual level between, by, mainly by email between TST contacts and, the, and their conveners. Uh, so Nalini has asked, did you curate the information, newsletters in Teams and or Moodle? Okay, so what we did was I put the things that I thought were most useful to the school into the See It newsletter on a weekly basis. Um, and then I put a bigger selection of resources onto the host Moodle site. So that way everybody could access it, not just the TST people. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, I think the last thing, emails from TST contacts to conveners, I think that was a really important part of what we did, that personal contact, because I, I certainly know that I'm guilty of this. Just because it's in the newsletter doesn't mean I've necessarily read it. It probably means I've skimmed it. In terms of actually taking it in and acting on it, meh, depends how busy I am and what else is going on. So realistically we didn't want to assume that just because it was in the newsletter people had read it so that's where the personal emails came in so if a tst member saw something in the newsletter or wherever and thought oh yeah my convener is trying to solve this problem they could immediately copy it and send it to them okay so the monitoring part so that's the support bit we were also tasked with monitoring and making sure that everything got delivered and everything happened properly. So it wasn't a formal review, which is what we'd been doing for the couple of years before that, but it was more just kind of a, a, a check in every now and then. So the aim was that every TST person should be regularly emailing or phoning or whatever their convener and saying, hey, how are you doing? Have you finished? whatever the current task is that we're all madly running around like headless chooks trying to do. So regular check-ins and especially at key points during semester when we just had to get stuff done. Okay, so May's asked how many courses were checked by a person. Um, 
So the TST contacts had anywhere from one to, I think, three or four was probably the most. Probably an average of, well, actually, it's 54 courses, 31 TST people, about one and a half on average each. Um, so it was not a huge burden, I hope. I guess my TST team might want to disagree with me. Hopefully it wasn't a huge burden on any individual. Oh, what happens when there was a problem? Oh, I will get to that, honestly. Um, yeah, I'm not going to claim there were no problems. There were definitely problems here and there. So the first key point was um, getting the revised course outline done. And that was that was probably one of the most challenging things in the transition was getting people to have a look at what they thought they were going to do and then say, OK, you're not going to be face to face. You're just not. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be any face to face assessment. Just give up on that idea now and revise your course outline to be fully online. So that was a really big task and required a lot of people to do a lot of difficult thinking. Um, we also had check-ins to make sure that communication with students was happening, that there was you know, stuff going up on discussion boards and so on. And then as we shifted fully into online, that the Moodle site was updated with content and that it was ideally a couple of weeks ahead. And then there was also a check-in point at the first online assessment task. So that was a little bit different. That was a bit variable, course to course, depending on when people were doing that stuff. And ideally, as well as all of that, about a fortnightly check-in, at least. Ideally weekly, but I think fortnightly was, was probably realistically what tended to happen. Um, and this is just a screenshot of one of, our, of the spreadsheet that we kept in Teams showing what was happening with each course. So I know this is too small to read and that's partly intentional. I just wanted you to get a sense of what it looked like. So TST contact, whoop, back a bit. TST contact, the course code and colour coded. So green is, it's all good. We don't have any worries about this course. Yellow is, we've got a bit of a concern. It's It should be okay, but we need to keep an eye on it and might need a bit more support or might need, might need something at some stage. Um, orange, serious problems. We really need to be addressing this and making sure this is getting sorted as soon as possible. And red is, yeah, this is, this is potentially not deliverable. So we started off basically as the default being yellow, and then once we got our first reports in from TST, we were able to colour code. And at that stage, quite a lot of things came up as orange. We had a couple that were looking red, a small number that were kind of green right from the start because we had conveners who knew what they were doing and were able to kind of get straight into it. Within a couple of weeks, almost everything was green, which was fantastic. And then things occasionally flickered to other colours. So this one flicked from green back to yellow when the, I think part of a roof fell in in one of the buildings. So then there was a problem with making videos of labs in that building. So even apart from COVID, we then had um, the sky falling in on us. Okay. Meanwhile, while TST, oh, sorry, May had a question. Do you check in on the students? Um, Yes, and this is kind of, I guess, a bit what this was about. So at the same time as we had TST kind of working with the staff, our head of school, Scott, was running these online forums. And I started seeing them later on with, for example, the rector, and then there were the Kensington ones, but I'm pretty sure that Scott was first off the bat with this stuff, and they were fantastic. What he did was he got online, he had a forum open to all the students in see it. A lot of them showed up and he basically kind of laid it out. You know, this is what's happening. This is what we're doing. We want to hear from you. We care about your experience. We're all doing the best that we can. Um, and I think one of the really, really important statements that Scott made was that we have to make decisions and we have to make them quickly and some of them are going to be wrong, but we are listening to you and we are doing our best. And I think that helped a huge amount. There's, 
I mean, every time you turn on the TV at the moment, there's some jingle, you know, we're all in this together. There's some kind of fluffy platitudes. But Scott actually got in there and did it and had this open communication with students, set up frequently asked question pages for students, shared the emergency assessment procedure with students. So it was a very open process and students felt that they were being listened to and they understood that even if they didn't agree with all of the decisions, that the reality was the decisions had to be made and that they were being made with the best intentions possible. So I hope that answers your question, May. So students had the, they had a voice throughout all of this. Plus there were also um, student focus groups run kind of late in semester as well. OK, so this was our emergency assessment procedure. And a lot of this is much is well is because it had to be consistent with the UNSW procedures. So a lot of this will be familiar to all of you. So we went to SAT fail only for all courses and also for all tasks. So. Yes. Yeah, sorry, someone want to. Yep. So all tasks were only satisfactory or fail. Um, and rubrics had to be provided to justify to students why they got one or the other, as well as to provide useful feedback to them. Courses also were satisfactory or fail only, and a satisfactory meant that a student had demonstrated each of the course, learn course learning outcomes at least once. We, were, we provided two opportunities minimum to demonstrate each course learning outcome. So if students stuffed it the first time, they had another opportunity. Um, and we were also encouraged to offer additional tasks to students who were struggling. It's this middle one here, online quizzes, 24 hour duration minimum and open book. That's one that, that's one that I think was peculiar to see it. Um, I'm sure the students appreciated it because it reduced their, their stress quite a lot, but some of the academics struggled a bit with that as a way of doing things. Because we were doing all this very rapidly, there was a moratorium put on large assessment tasks, anything over 15%. So we were doing this at about week three um, and basically all summative assessment was put on hold until week six, just so we could get ourselves sorted. May has asked, are our students still on campus? Yeah, they are, they're in lockdown. They're all on campus, they're in their divs. They're not allowed out at the moment. Um, we have a small number of civilians, they're not allowed on campus. And we have absolutely no face to face classes, no face to face contact with any of our students. Um, as well as those rules, there were some guidelines. So better not to have exams, instead do things like fevers so you can judge students understanding by talking to them online. And as I said before, provide additional opportunities to show for students to demonstrate course learning outcomes. OK, so how did it all work? Well, fortunately, it did work. All 54 of our courses were delivered online. All 54 had the grades put in at the end. Um, most of the course components transitioned successfully. Labs were a bit of a challenge, of course, so some people made videos of labs and then provided students with data. Other people moved to simulations. The only thing that was not able to be moved online and the only single course outline, sorry, course learning outcome that I'm aware of that, that had to be dropped. So the only one out of all the course learning outcomes for all of these 54 courses was a hand was a tools one. And you really can't do that online. So that was a workshop component where students had to go into the workshop and do safety training and actually use tools with their hands. So that one has been delayed until 2021, but everything else was delivered. And our, my experience scores went up. So on the whole, I think while when we were told you're moving online, you've got a, you know, a few days a week to do that, it was 
it was very stressful for I imagine everybody. But in the end, we actually did manage to deliver everything and uh, my experience, our student satisfaction went up. Um, and to be honest, I suspect that the biggest single effect in this was was the head of schools forums, you know, engaging students and giving them a voice, but also giving them very, very clear messaging. So they knew what was going on, they knew why it was going on. Do feel free to ask questions as we go. OK, and for those who like graphs, like me, I like graphs. So on the left hand side here, we've got the main my experience scores. So remember that's a one to six scale. So we had a jump from 2019 to 2020, both for the um, average. This is the average satisfaction kind of summary question. So it went up both for courses and for teachers. And the learning and teaching agree value also went up. So that's the, the fraction, the percent of the responses that were uh, agree. So I think it goes moderately agree, agree, strongly agree. So those three categories. So in both of those, we actually had an increase. So in spite of all the panic, all the how the how are we going to do this? We actually managed to improve our student satisfaction. OK, biggest challenges. Um, I think the single biggest challenge was the paradigm shift for the staff. So going from being used to being in the classroom with their students and remember with all of their students or very close to all, we have close to 100 percent attendance normally. Attendance and engagement dropped, you know, even though the students might have been happier and my experience went up, attendance did drop online compared to face to face. Um, so they, they were less engaged than they normally would be. And there were a range of reasons for that. You know, partly it was to do with what was going on in their own lives, partly it was because it's just a difficult transition for students as well as for staff. For staff, the idea that no, you can't have an invigilated exam, that was a huge problem for some of the staff. They really struggled with the idea that you can do assessment without an exam. Um, but for some of them, at least now that that's been demonstrated, I've actually had feedback from a couple of people saying that was actually really good. I'm going to, you know, move a bit away from exams in the future. Labs, of course, and one that was kind of that. Well, I mean, as Merlin introduced me at the start, I'm a physicist hiding in an engineering school. So maybe this would have been obvious to someone else. But the thing that was a bit of a what the for me was that the IT courses had trouble moving online. I thought that would have been a hang on your IT. Surely this should be trivial for you. But in fact, there turned out to be various software licensing issues that meant that it was difficult for the IT people to move their labs online. Um, academic integrity was also an issue. So we did have more plagiarism cases last semester than we normally do. Uh, so there's a question there. How did you manage plagiarism for the 24 hour exams? Exactly the same as you manage plagiarism for anything else. Um, turn it in, uh, various similarity checkers, and so on. So effectively a 24 hour exam means an assignment with a very short time frame. And communication. Um, mostly the communication was really good, but where the communication failed, that was where the problems were. And which way the causality goes, I'm not sure, possibly both ways, but certainly when people were not responding to their TST contacts or in a couple of really unfortunate cases where the TST contacts were not keeping in good communication either with me or with their conveners, that's where things, yeah, that's where things were not as pleasant as they could have been. So the things that worked on the whole, the communication worked really well. Having those clear lines of communication, having the personal communication, I think was massively important. Knowing that there was an individual person to contact and who was also contacting you on a regular basis, I think was really important. <laughs> Given that students are all living together, was there evidence of exam parties? 
Um, yeah, look, there was a bit. And but that's not a new thing here. Well, I guess it is for exams. It's certainly not a new thing for assignments. But as I said at the start, the fact that our students collaborate a lot is also a good thing. Because it means you can use that to set them tasks that use that collaboration to help them learn. Um, sorry, back on to what worked. The technology mostly worked well, um, especially Collaborate. I think there are a lot of people now, including me, to be honest, who are fans of Collaborate. It's it's a nice system. It's shockingly hungry for bandwidth. I can't use it where I live, which is out of town. I just don't have the connectivity, but it's very nice when you can use it. And Teams was really good for the various teams of people working together. But I think the single most important thing was people just getting on with it. Once people got over the initial, oh my God, how are we going to cope? They tended to just roll up their sleeves and get on with it. So once they accepted that it had to be done, almost everyone just did it. And the helping of each other was actually really lovely to see. So the TST people helping other people within the school. And remember TST is it's part of SEED. It's not a separate thing. It's SEED academics. And, you know, they were helping their colleagues. People who weren't part of TST were also sharing resources and then they were being shared as well. So it was actually quite a nice collaborative way of working. OK. Last things. So right at the end of semester, I ran a survey of the semester conveners. Bunch of questions. Um, what did you do differently? What worked? What didn't work? What tips do you have for, well, for semester two conveners? Actually, I should have said that at the start. We are not T3 plus. We are still semester one, semester two here. So even apart from having quite different students, we actually run on a different um, a different kind of time scale. We still have 13 week semesters. So tips from our first semester conveners. Expect to spend more time communicating with students outside the lecture and lab hours. Mix up your course with both synchronous and asynchronous. One of the things that we did in first semester was the requirement that everything be available asynchronously. So if you're going to run synchronous classes, you must record them. They must be there for those who can't attend at the time. And I think that was really helpful. Um, so for the trainee officers, Mostly they should be able to attend face to face, although I was in one meeting with one student and, you know, we're sitting there on teams like this and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, he opens it and the military police come in. So they were just doing inspections. This, he wasn't being arrested or anything. But, you know, even the ones that we probably thought there would be no problems with attendance, they still were having calls on their time that they didn't have control over. We also have what we call advanced students or Omega Squadron, and they are the currently serving officers and they have families. Um, I got an email from one who was really stressed because his wife is a frontline health worker, so she was working long shifts. He was home looking after the kids, which made it basically impossible for him to get to classes. So that requirement that everything be available asynchronously I guess for people who are used to teaching online, maybe it's a bit of a no brainer, but for us, it was actually a bit of a paradigm shift. We're used to our students being there in the room with us. So that was a new thing to recognize that we had to provide things outside of class times as well. Um, really important one, be clear about what Paul scholarship looks like and what plagiarism is and do that before the first assessment task. So head off any uncertainty about what plagiarism is. Um, using the same platform, that was one thing that I did hear from a couple of students, you know, using Teams for this and Collaborate for that and a third thing for another course and so on, was a little bit confusing and challenging for them. Having things kind of in the one place was just easier. And I think the last one, while again, that's something you would always do face to face anyway, it's easy to forget things when you move online, things that you might take for granted face to face. 
but it's important to actually motivate students from the beginning. Give them a reason to be there. Um, and that top one, that's one that, you know, I'm certainly experiencing and I'm sure all of you who've been doing the online teaching also for the first time also now recognise there is more work in it than you, than you anticipate and you really need to be well prepared. And it's also amazing what things can go wrong. Um, I was giving a lecture last week and in my office because my connection's not good enough at home and suddenly I had no network and it was because part of the building had flooded. Fortunately, one of my 12 year old sons had shown me how to use my mobile as a hotspot, so I was able to switch on to that. But having backup plans, knowing how to use the technology, testing out the tools in advance, all these things are really important. And thinking carefully about how you're going to assess students. Again, this is not an online thing in particular, but just in general. Always ask yourself, what am I actually trying to assess? What am I trying to measure here? And then design your assessment accordingly. And I think that one of the good things about having to do this transition and having to have these paradigm shifts is it got people thinking a bit more about how they assess instead of just going for the, oh, but we have exams, that's how we assess. Actually thinking about, well, I can't have an exam. I need to know if they can do this. How can I assess it? And I think that has contributed to opening people up a bit more to different ways of assessing. And my favourite thing that came out of that survey, even though I know it's not relevant to a lot of you folk there, um, keep in contact with TST. They can help you and don't be shy to ask. Certainly the don't be shy to ask for help. I think that's really important. Um, sitting and worrying and feeling alone is not a good experience. So if you've got people that you can ask for help, do so. OK, and I'm just going to open up the rest of my list. So Malim has said there was a lot of sharing, peer support and communications. Do you think this can be sustained? Um, I don't think it can, no, to be quite honest. Um, realistically, we had in TST about a third of the school and there was a lot of communication going around and there's only so much time and headspace that you can have for this sort of thing. Um, I think it was incredibly effective for what we needed at the time, but we are already in the process of shifting back to business as usual and starting up course reviews again. So this semester, TST is back down to its normal about 15 people. Half of them are on the postgraduate review group, starting to do review of postgrad courses. The other half are doing support so like what I've described, but doing that for the people who have asked for support to continue in semester two or people who weren't teaching in semester one. So the kind of full on version, no, we can't sustain that, but we can sustain a simpler, smaller version. Um, and that's basically all I wanted to say, apart from a few thank yous to all of my team, the expert teams, all of my colleagues. Tells, Owen is our tells person. I don't think he's here, but hopefully someone will tell him that he's fantastic and we couldn't have coped without him. I know Diana's here. She knows we couldn't have coped without her, not even close. Um, Scott's support as head of school has been massively important. And finally, thank you, Remy, for organising this and running me through how to do it. And thanks, everybody. Happy to take questions. Well done, Kate. <coughs> So that is great. It's such a good news story overall. And the engagement that one has with the community of teachers and then the students also sort of under a bit of pressure and muddling through, um, it's remarkable. And um, But you did start with a very logical and uh, military operation, the way you set it out at the very beginning and your, with your diagrams and your... Um, your strategy for triaging things. So I think it's terrific. The comments have been really good. Um, you know, I shouldn't keep saying it, but I'm pleased your My Experience scores went up. It's funny, Canberra's My Experience scores have been, you're a little bit susceptible to um, it, um, trends and fashions, but the scores have been great. Um, 
uh, and at the moment it's it's really good. I'm just looking whether people want to ask questions. You've dealt with a lot of the questions as things were going. Um, does anyone want to actually speak up and ask a human question? Because it's sort of funny. Oh, the slide on things that didn't work. Yep, I can bounce back to that. Okay, biggest challenges. Sorry, I'm, I'm euphemism here. Biggest challenges. Um, did you have a particular question, Ricardo, or did you just want to have a look at it again? No, thanks. Uh, just uh, having a look at it again. Thanks again. Okay. Yeah, I was, I think the people I've talked to labs has been challenging and, you know, some of the demonstrating with the labs and, you know, trying to act things out and show videos. The academic integrity has bothered me a lot. Um, you know, by and large it's worked, but every now and then students have just, oh, you know, received messages from other students, everyone's cheating, you know, it's okay. And then the last students yeah. jump the one and it's just such a tragedy because I think there's students who wouldn't normally have cheated, but under these exceptional circumstances and, and their penalties are quite tough. Um, we need tough penalties for the people who are going to cheat, you know, and make a living out of it. But the, I feel for the students who normally would never do this, but the circumstances are weird and, oh, everyone else is doing it and then they cheat and they get caught. It's, it's even a bigger deal here because it's not just about the, the academic integrity issue, it's an integrity issue full stop and the ADFA values crisp. The I in the middle of that is integrity. So if there is evidence that they are not demonstrating integrity, that goes back, that has to go back to defence. And then the question is asked, are they fit to be an officer in the Australian Defence Force? And if the answer to that is no, then they are out the door, find another career. So it's not just about you fail the subject or, you know, worst case you get booted out of UNSW, you're also out of your service. That's a big penalty. Um, yeah, one hopes that having a very big penalty like that does um, reduce the problem of um, cheating. I would love to have, I don't know if people remember the Yul Brynner ads with the don't smoke, just don't smoke. I want a plagiarism version of that with a student, you know, maybe kind of pixelated out you know, with their uniform cast aside because they've been booted out saying, don't cheat, just don't cheat. <laughs> that's a nice, Peter's just put a nice quote there. I think that's, uh, that's right. I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think part of the problem is that, you know, plagiarism and in working together and, you know, being enthusiastic and discussing your assignments and things you know, there is this grey area with, you know, really just working together and copying off each other. And you said, be clear at the very outset about what plagiarism is. And I think that's very good advice. And Peter's advice is easy to communicate too. Yeah. Okay, I'm determined that we finish two minutes early because people will have other Zooms to go to. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, that was terrific. I'm so impressed by how well you've done. And I know I keep hearing some quite good news stories and I don't always hear them. <laughs> I didn't so much during 3 Plus. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I know you're not on 3 Plus, but thank you. Thanks for all the people who've come. Thanks for the engagement and thanks to Remy for organising it. These are great talks. And I look forward to seeing you in the post-COVID world. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. No worries at all. Thank you all very much for coming along.